Today we will be going into 1 John chapter 3. So if you guys can all turn and open your Bible to 1 John chapter 3, and we will be looking at 1 John chapter 3 verses 4 to 10. So why don't we all stand together and let's read 1 John chapter 3, 4 to 10. And let's all read it together, actually, with one verse. One, two, three. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or have known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, because your word gives us powerful truth. And it's truth enough to motivate us to change, truth that can give us eternal life, truth that can transform our sinful selves to become more like you. And Lord, I pray that your truth will truly transform us, it will pierce our hearts, and it will train us and teach us and rebuke us and correct us and conform us to your will. Lord, may you speak to us powerfully, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, church, what is the hardest thing that you have ever done? What is the hardest thing you have ever done? What do you think is one of the hardest things you have ever done? So think of that, okay? And I can tell you one thing that is the hardest thing that you've ever done, but you might not be aware, okay? And I'm certain that this is right. The hardest thing that you've ever done is to stop sinning. And I think none of us have reached that yet. Have you ever noticed it is very, very hard to stop sinning? Have you ever noticed it's just so hard? And you know, we all know as Christians, we're not supposed to sin, but I think one thing we can be certain of is that it is the battle, the official, the hardest battle that a Christian engages in daily, which is to not sin. And nothing else is harder than not sinning. But I think a blessing that God has left us, left us with is that we are not left to ourselves to battle sin. And He has given us His Holy Spirit, which dwells in us, so that we may be able to not give in to temptation, but also He has given us His truth. He has given us His Bible to fight against sin. And we know that the Bible is a Christian sword against Satan, against sin. So the truth is very important. Now, how is the truth important to fight against sin? And it's this. So just imagine if you didn't know anything about snakes, or anything about poisonous frogs, right? And let's say if you saw a, a very colorful snake or a very colorful frog, wouldn't you want to touch it like because it's so colorful? But if you knew that a colorful snake or a frog is usually poisonous, you would keep away from it. So the truth motivates you to stop doing something. Now the truth of God motivates us to stop sinning. So when we have the truth of God, when we understand it, we can be motivated to stop sinning. So we're going to talk about three ways, three motivations that John gives us to stop sinning. And they're really good ones. Okay? And we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 to 10. So the first reason and the first motivation to stop sinning is this. Okay? Sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So John says, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. So what does the word practice mean? I'm sure some of you guys have heard this, this kind of phrase, um, that a lawyer practices law, and
and a doctor practices medicine, right? So the word practices, it, it kind of has a sense of something that a person does habitually, even to the, to the sense of a career. Somebody does it as a career. So if somebody's practicing sin, somebody is actually habitually sinning. And sin is almost kind of like his career, something that he does continually. And John says this, someone who makes sin his practice, kind of like a doctor makes medicine his practice, is practicing lawlessness. So the question is, what is lawlessness? Because it sounds pretty bad. Lawlessness sounds pretty bad, right? So what is lawlessness? It is really bad. Lawlessness is rebellion against God. That's what lawlessness is. It's rebellion against God. It's a violation and a breaking of God's law. That's what lawlessness is. Now, in our modern culture, sin is something that's sin as seen as nothing too bad. Or people don't even believe in sin, some people. Or many would think that sin is not too bad. Some people think that sin, oh, it's just a mistake. Oops, I did it again. Or something is just very common to human nature because nobody is perfect, right? We all make mistakes, and therefore everybody, of course, sins. So if everyone does it, it's just an ordinary human failure. So it's not that bad. However, John is telling us, no, sin is not just a simple mistake. Sin is not just an ordinary human failure, which it is. It is human failure, but it's not supposed to be ordinary. Because sin is lawlessness. John, John Calvin says this, sin comes from contempt. That word contempt means hatred and defiance of God. So sin is basically a rejection of God's law. And here's the thing, when you reject God's law, you're actually rejecting God's purpose, you're rejecting God's will, and ultimately you're rejecting God himself. And if you guys remember everything that we've been studying in 1 John so far, remember we talked about the Antichrist, now in this passage we're talking about the devil. So if you're looking at sin in the context of all this, sin is really connected to the Antichrist, is connected to the devil. So sin ultimately is anti-Jesus. When we sin, we're doing something that's against Jesus. In Psalm 51, David says this, after he committed his infamous sin of committing adultery and murder, this is what David says to God when confronted by the prophet Nathan. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So David committed sin against, against Bathsheba. He committed sin against Uriah, but actually, ultimately, he says, against you only. Ultimately, when he broke God's law in committing adultery and murder, he was going against God. So, think of it this way, okay? If a child disobeyed a parent's rule, would you say, hey, this, this child disobeyed his parent's rule? No, you would say that child disobeyed his parents. Nobody say, oh, that, that parent is, I mean, that child is so bad because he, he disobeys his parents' rules. You always say this child is disobedient because he disobeys his parents. So when we are sinning, we're actually not just breaking his rules. We are going against God. So sin is a practice that is against God himself. So church, do you understand that when you practice sin, when you sin, it is really doing something that is against God himself. And like a doctor whose career is practicing medicine, if our career is in a sinful lifestyle, our career is against God. And that cannot be. Instead, a child of God needs to not be lawless, but law-loving. This is what Psalm 119 says. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So as a child of God, we cannot hate God's law. We cannot go against God's law. Instead, like the psalmist says, we should love God's law. And I've been reading a book about what it means to delight in God. It talks about how, hey, as a child of God, our recreation should be the law of God. As in, this should be our hobby. Because the world, like, find many ways to have recreation, right? They go do a lot of different things, but for a child of God, our recreation, our hobby, our love, our passion should be God's ways because why? We love God and we know God loves us. So 
Sin is lawlessness, but as a child of God, we are not lawless. We love the law because we love the one who made the law. We love God. So that should be a motivation that we don't want to be against God because God is our Father. We want to be for God, so we love His law. And in verse 5, we see this. Jesus came, you know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there's no sin. Jesus came to take away sins. He came to take away sin because in Him there is no sin. So He came to take away the sins of His children because if we were to belong to Him, we cannot have a record of sin so he came to take that away so if he suffered on the cross in order to take away our sins how can we devalue and dishonor what Christ has done on the cross to take away our sins by sinning so therefore that's a motivation for us not to sin because Jesus suffered to take away our sins and verse 6 no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So John talks about abiding, and we've talked about this many times. Abiding means to remain, right? So John is making the point that a child of God is in union with Jesus Christ. And being united with the one who has no sin, and being united with the one who came to take away our sin, obviously the one who belongs to him, who remains in him, will have Jesus working in him to take away his sins little by little okay so the record of sin has been forgiven but our practice every day is that we we do sin at least probably once a week and if we're honest we probably sin once a day at least right so if jesus came to take away our sins he didn't just take away the record he wants to take away the sinful practice of our daily lives so therefore our our sinfulness should be kind of like a decreasing line graph, okay? Where it goes from here and it goes downwards because Jesus is taking away our sins. He's making us and transforming us so that we sin less and less and less and less as we grow more mature in Him. But if our sinful rate is in a straight line, then that's making a practice of sin. And that is lawlessness. And we cannot be doing that as a child of God. So church, you cannot have a straight line of sinning in your life. It needs to be decreasing because Jesus is working in you to really sanctify you, to make your sins decrease in your life. John Chris Sultan, he's one of the great preachers in church history. He says to sin is human. Okay, so as humans, we all sin. However, to persevere in sin is not human, but altogether sat satanic. So we do sin, yes, we fall, we make mistakes, but to continue, to persevere, to make it a habit, to make it a career, to make it a practice, that would be satanic. So therefore, if we're children of God, we must turn from sin and remain free of lawlessness and grow in righteousness, which is what we're going to talk about next. The reason why we should stop sinning, number one, is because sin is lawlessness. Second, is because sin is of the devil. Sin is of the devil. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So John starts this portion by saying, don't let anyone deceive you or lie to you. By saying that righteousness is not important. There are a lot of teachers in John's day and even today that says, hey, you know what? If Jesus has done everything to forgive you, then actually it doesn't matter what you do afterwards, right? Righteousness doesn't matter if Jesus has died for you, so therefore you can live your life however you want if Christ really has given you imputed righteousness. Now, there's two types of righteousness that we need to know, okay? One is called positional, positional righteousness. That means when a person believes in Jesus Christ, his position with God is that he has a righteous standing with God. So it is a court-like righteousness in which if we stand before God now, he would declare us not guilty and he would declare us righteous because Jesus' righteousness, when we believe in him, has been credited to us. So our record is what Jesus has done in his perfect life. We have that credited to us. But that's a, a positional type of righteousness, okay? However, what about our practice 
is different, right? Even though we have this position of righteousness, we know that we're not completely righteous in our behavior. I think we can all be honest in stating that we sin at least once a week, and if we're truly honest, we sin at least, we sin at least once a day, right? So we're not that righteous in terms of our behavior. So there is this thing called practical righteousness. Now, positional righteousness we've been given. We're forgiven once and for all, before God, we're declared righteous. However, our practice doesn't match that positional righteousness yet because every day we're still falling into sin. So what Jesus does in us is that he sanctifies us. He works in us so that our practice of righteousness, our practical righteousness will match our positional righteousness. So he's doing work in our lives so that we become less and less sinful, but more and more righteous so that our practical righteousness will meet our positional righteousness eventually and definitely it will meet when we die and meet him face to face okay so here's the thing jesus works in us through his truth through his spirit by transforming our lives to make us more and more holy so he purifies us he shapes us but ultimately god the father is our parents he is our father he's our parents and what do parents do? Good parents do? He, they discipline us. They shape us. They correct us. They rebuke us. They train us. So what God does is He parents us in righteousness. So here's the thing. How do we know that someone is righteous? We can tell that someone is righteous if their practice is also righteous. Because it shows that God is parenting that child in righteousness. So he's growing in righteousness, and that shows that he already has positional righteousness as well. Does that make sense? So we can tell that God is doing the work in a person's life. Now this is very important because I think we all understand this truth. Have you guys ever heard the saying that you can tell how you can tell how a child acts reflects the parenting of that child? For example, if a child is always on time. He's disciplined, he's polite, he's respectful to others, he's caring. You can tell what kind of parenting this child received, right? However, if a child is always tardy, undisciplined, disrespectful, full of a part, like potty mouth, you can also tell what kind of parenting that child received. Now, this is where verse eight comes, comes in. That's very important. It says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. This is very important. The devil is the biggest sinner. He is the longest sinner. He is the oldest sinner. He's the biggest sinner. He's the hardest working sinner. He's the ultimate sinner. Okay, He's the biggest sinner of them all. And there's two types of families, spiritual families on earth. There's the family of God and there's family of Satan. The, the Bible makes that very clear. Now, if God is righteous and Satan is the ultimate sinner, and whoever is a child of God, God parents them to become more and more righteous. If someone lives a life of sin, who is that person a child of? Who is parenting them? It's very clear. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, a lifestyle of sinning, is of the devil. The devil is their parent. The devil is their dad. The devil is their daddy. And the devil is the one that parents them and leads them and influences them and trains them and educates them to sin. So in our culture, there's a lot of teaching about, hey, you know, you should do your own thing. You should be empowered to do what you want in life. And there's a deception there because ultimately, unless one is in Jesus Christ, they cannot do what they truly desire to do. They're ultimately being influenced manipulated and lied to by the devil educated by the devil without even knowing it ultimately leading them into a lifestyle of sin so eight let's go into the second part of verse eight and it talks about the reason the son of god appeared was to destroy the works of the devil so once again, John talks about how Jesus came not to only take away sin, but to destroy sin, the work of the devil. So just think of it this way, okay? Just imagine a dad who's an artist, and he creates this sculpture, 
and he spends months and months working on this piece of art because he's an artist and this is his work and he put his heart and soul into it and let's say this child sees the father's work right and he's in an age where he understands it takes a lot of work to do a piece of art like this so after his dad is finally finished with this piece of art this piece of, piece of sculpture the child out of spite just comes and destroy this piece of sculpture isn't that an insult to the father like really how can this child do this now similarly if Jesus came to destroy the works of the, the devil and came to take away sin if we sin wouldn't that be us rebuilding what Christ's purpose came to destroy does that make sense why would we why how can we do that to our father and here's the thing we are not child of the sake of the devil and are you a child of the devil are you a child of satan no right then we cannot live in a way like we're parented by satan we need to live in a way in which we're parented by jesus christ by god our father so therefore we need to live a life of righteousness we want to be obedient to our loving father so two motivations so far that will help us to not sin one is sin is lawlessness second is sin is of the devil lastly sin is not of the children of god sin is not of the children of god a child of god should nowhere be near the practice of sin verse 9 No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So we all know this. As a child of God, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have been born again. And this, this is a concept that Jesus talks about a lot. You know, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again, he says to Nicodemus. So when we believe in Christ, we have a new life born again we're a new creation with a new nature now this is very important we have a new nature in us right and first peter 1 23 says this you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of god so here in verse 9 john also says god's seed is in him so this seed is the same seed that peter is talking about it's amazing right how the apostles have one mind john talks about the seed peter talks about seed what is the seed the seed is god's eternal word the eternal word which god planted in us which transformed us regenerated us by the power of his spirit to become a new creation with a new life with a new nature now here's the thing because we have been born again we have god's seed in us so we are of a new nature a nature that is of god therefore we're not compatible with sin because we're of this new nature and verse 10 says this by this it is evident who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil whoever does not practice righteousness is not of god nor is the one who does not love his brother now the differences between a child of god and a child of satan is going to be very clear and this is why think of this so think of a fish you guys like fishes so think of a fish oh some of us have fishes at home so think about this a fish when it's in the water it swims very happily right very happy in, in the in the in the water now what if one day the nature of the fish was completely changed the fish was given lungs legs feet arms and hands its nature would completely change right suddenly the water would not be very comfortable for the fish and it would want to get out and be in the on the land instead because it has lungs and in his arms and his legs right so no longer does it want to be in the water because its whole nature has changed it will want to be in a different environment so how similar it is to a person who's been reborn born again of god our nature has completely changed in the past before christ we used to swim in sin we used to swim in darkness because our nature is a sinful nature but when god rebirthed us by the power of his spirit he gave us a brand new nature we've been given new lungs we've been given a new spiritual hands and feet to the point where we would we should 
find sin completely uncomfortable, unhospitable, because it is not in our nature to swim in it anymore. Instead, we want to walk on the solid ground of God's word and the solid ground of God's kingdom. Our na- because our nature has completely changed. And John is saying that it is clear that if a person says that he is Christian, however, is still in sin, his nature has never actually really changed because a person who has been born again cannot find himself swimming in, in sin anymore. Just as a fish who has been given legs and arms and, and lungs will no longer want to, to swim in the water anymore. And finally, John says this about love. He says, nor is the one who does not love his brother is not of God. So he gives a test to easily see whether a person is of God. And he links this to the next passage is whether someone loves God and loves others. Whether someone loves others. So love is part of a Christian's new nature as well. How do we know if we're obeying God, if we're doing righteousness? Well, righteousness has so much to do with love. If we're loving, then we are born again of God because God is love. So if you don't love those who are around you, then maybe you do not have the nature of God in you yet. So we learned three powerful truths today to motivate you to not to sin. Number one, sin is lawlessness. It is rebellion against God. Sin is of the devil. Only those of the devil practices sin as a lifestyle. Sin is, is not of those born of God because we have no longer gills and fins that are adapted to swimming in sin. We have arms and legs to do good works in the Lord. There's a writer called Thomas Brooks, and he wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. So basically, he talks about certain ways to fight against Satan's temptations. And he makes this very interesting point. He says, do you know what the worst thing is? The absolute worst thing. It's sin. Sin is so bad that it's even worse than hell. Now, I think a lot of us, when we, when we really have to think what is the worst thing that there is, it's hell, right? Hell is the one thing we want to avoid. Hell is the one place that we don't want to be. Hell is one of the reasons why we believe in Jesus Christ, so that we do not have to suffer God's eternal wrath in hell. Hell is the worst place that we can think of. It's probably the worst thing. But Thomas Brooks says, no, sin is worse than hell. Sin is worse than hell. Why? Think about it. Who made hell? God made hell. Who has a purpose for hell? God actually has a purpose for hell. He has his purposes to judge there. And actually, God is glorified through hell. Because actually, he made hell and therefore his judgment is executed through hell to those who are in sin. So hell actually glorifies God. However, sin is pure evil. Sin is rebellion against God. It is 100% against God's desire. God hates sin above all else. So what is the most abominable thing there is, is sin. And therefore, as Christians, we have to hate sin even more than we hate hell. And this is a famous quote that I've heard. We have to hate sin so much that we would rather be in hell and sinless versus being heaven and have sin in our lives. Does that make sense? We have to hate sin so much that we would rather be in hell and have no sin in us than to be in heaven with sin in us. Therefore, sin is the worst thing possible. Church, we have to hate sin in our lives. Why? Because it is lawlessness, it is of the devil, and it is not of those who are born of God. So church, I pray that we would turn away from sin and we would make every effort empowered by the Holy Spirit to kill off sin in our lives and to not sin in our lives. Let's take this time to pray. If there's any habitual sin that's in our lives, let's cry out to God to help us to no longer continue on with that sin. If there's any sin that we need to confess, Let's confess that to our Father and ask Him to 
truly cleanse us of that sin. And let's thank our God for sending and giving His Son, Jesus Christ, to take away our sins so that we can be accepted though we sin. And let's ask Jesus to give us, to continually give us sanctification so that more and more we're becoming more righteous and we are looking more like Him. Let's take this time to pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for your grace. That you present yourself to take away our sins and sin on this Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to take away our sins. And Lord, we thank you for adopting us into your house as your children. We thank you for giving us new life, regenerating us, so that we are of a completely new nature. And so we know that sin has no place in you and therefore sin needs to be cleansed out of us. And Lord, we pray that you would do your work to sanctify us, to scrub our darkness, our sins out of us, Lord. May you scrub us to become more and more pure like yourself. Help us to hate sin because sin is of the devil sin is lawlessness and as children of you we can no longer walk or swim or play around in sin may you change our thoughts may your truth help us to keep away from sin as we would keep away from poisonous animals lord we thank you for your grace in our lives that even though we are so sinful lord that you would accept us Thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you for your atoning work on the cross by taking the punishment we deserve. And thank you for crediting to us righteousness and may you make us righteous to match the position that we have. Lord, we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.